Hello, my name is Michael Kaler, and I am the lab manager of the Gyme Diffraction Facility, which is a user facility housed in the Joint Institute for Advanced Materials at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Individuals from UT, outside universities, national labs, and industry are all welcome to use our facilities. In this video, I will show you how to use the Sharer Calculator and HighScore Plus to determine crystallite size. This video is part one of a three-part series highlighting Scherer's equation, Williamson Hall plots, and Riedfeld refinement in the determination of crystallite size and microstrain. All files used in this video are provided by Panalytical and should be located on your computer so that you can practice these analysis techniques. Let's begin by looking at Scherer's equation, shown here. We see that the crystallite size equals k times lambda divided by B sample times cosine theta. One thing to notice about this equation is that it does not incorporate microstrain. So then if your sample does have microstrain in it, that will throw off the results of the Scherer equation analysis and make the results less accurate. K is the crystal shape factor, which I will talk to you more about later. Lambda is the wavelength of radiation used in the experiment. So this example uses copper K-alpha radiation, so that is 1.5406 angstroms. B sample is the peak breadth in radians. And just to be clear, this is not the broadening that you see in the diffraction pattern, because the broadening in the diffraction pattern is caused by the sample broadening plus the instrumental broadening. So this one here is just the sample broadening. So we will have to determine this in a few minutes. And then theta is one half of the two theta position of the peak to which we are applying the Scherer equation. Now let's go ahead and determine B sample by first determining the instrumental broadening. Let's click File, Open. If you go to Local Disk C, Program Files x86, Panalytical, High Score, and Tutorial, you will see a whole list of files used in the example problems presented in High Score's help file. And if you have not looked into High Score's help file, I highly recommend you do so as it is quite beneficial. For this series of videos, we will be looking at these fluorite samples. This one is just raw. These have been heat treated at 4, 5, and 600 degrees. I will only be analyzing the raw file, but you can analyze the others if you like. And then the cerium oxide here is what we will use to determine the instrumental broadening. Let's begin with this file and double click. Just to make sure it is abundantly clear, you will not use this file if you are analyzing your own samples of interest. I'm only using this file because I am also analyzing those fluorite patterns provided by Panalytical. If you want to analyze your own samples, you will need to get your own line profile standard. Now these are available from NIST, and they are cerium oxide and lanthanum hexaboride, and there are others. But once you get your standard sample, you want to collect a diffraction pattern on it using the same instrument and the same exact optics that will be used for your sample of interest. If any of those optics are different, then your instrumental broadening will be different, and that will make your analysis less accurate. One more thing I want to point out is that if you are using a single peak for your analysis, and such is the case for Scherer's equation, you often get better results from using diffraction peaks between 30 and 50 degrees 2 theta. And that's because below 30 degrees 2 theta, peak asymmetry can compromise your profile analysis, and as you increase 2 theta, your peak intensity will tend to decrease, as shown in this diffraction pattern, and smaller intensity is not beneficial for analysis either. Choosing peaks between 30 and 50 degrees 2 theta tends to give a good balance between small asymmetry and larger intensity. So I will left click and draw a zoom box a little bit bigger than 30 to 50. For this example, I will just do about 25 to 65. And this part is optional, but I like to right click and then clip the range. And that deletes everything outside of this zoom window. That way, I can just focus in on these peaks. So I will right click, 
search peaks. I will use whatever settings are here and search peaks and accept. If we zoom in, we notice that we have a blue curve and a red curve. The blue curve is the calculated curve and the red curve is your data. We see that we have markers along the top. Solid markers signify K-alpha 1 peaks. Dotted markers signify K-alpha 2 peaks. So let's right click, zoom out. We do notice that we have some data markers for peaks that we don't really see. If we were to zoom in that we would see that they are there, so that's fine. Right click, zoom out. And before I begin refining anything, I will do a couple of things. I will come down here to the additional graphics window, right click, show graphics, and then difference plot, left click. Here we see the difference between the blue and red curves. We want that to be as small as possible. When in refinement control tab, I will left click global variables and then come over here to the solver tolerance and add one more zero to make it more demanding. Enter. And then while in automatic mode, I will click this button and perform a default profile fit. Here we see an RWP value. This gives us an idea as to how nicely the blue and red curves match. So for these types of values, smaller is better. Let me come up here and perform one more profile fit in order to make sure that RWP is stable. It barely changed, so I'm happy with that. Now I do want to check one more thing, so let's zoom in on these three peaks just for an example. We want to look at this low intensity region. You'll notice that I can't really focus in on that low intensity region. That's because this button here is activated. We want to click this button, which is zoom intensity. Once we click that, then we can draw our zoom box and it will allow us to zoom in better. I want to get a better look at some of this low intensity region here, but that's very close to the x-axis. So what I can do is right click, set manual ranges, and I will change this minimum intensity to zero. Click OK. Now we can see it a little bit better. You might also notice that there is this green, almost flat looking curve. That is your background curve. And the thing here that I want to point out is that your blue and red curves up here match up very nicely. But once you get to about this point, you see that the blue curve suddenly drops down to the green curve, even though the red curve more slowly decreases with decreasing two theta. Now this is affecting our fit, so if we want to fix this, we can go to global variables and left click, and we want to look at this peak base width times full width half maximum. What this means is that the width of our peak base is limited to be 20 times the full width half maximum of that peak. Now because our peak drops down to the background too quickly, we know that this value is too small. So we can change this to something such as 30, and watch the peak tails once I hit enter, and you will see that they better align with the red curve. I will hit enter now, and here you see a much better agreement between the two curves. When you get your own standard, I don't know if 30 will be the best peak base width for you, so you will need to zoom in and determine that on your own. So let's right click, zoom out, and let's come up here and perform one more default profile fit. Now let's go to File, Open, and let's select the data file that we want to analyze. So like I said, I will analyze the raw, so double click. I am going to focus in on this region here, again about 25 to 65 degrees to theta. Right click, clip range. I will then right click, search peaks. Click search peaks and accept. Before I perform my refinement, I will come down here, right click, 
show graphics and left click difference plot. I will come back here to left click global variables and once again make my solver tolerance a little more demanding by adding one zero. And I am going to go ahead and change my peak base width to 30 because I know that's going to work best for this sample. But once again, you will determine what works best for your sample. I will hit enter. And now we are ready to come up here and perform a default profile fit. We see that the RWP dropped down to about 10.44. Let me try another fit just to make sure it's stable. We saw that it dropped quite a bit more down to 6.2. So I will keep doing these profile fits until that stops changing, which is basically now. It just went down a very small amount. So now I will go back to the cerium oxide and I want to pick which peaks I want to use in the analysis. So let's left click peak list and I want to ignore these very tiny peaks because again those are not going to be the best ones to use for analysis. I can also see the peak height here so I can very easily tell that the very tiny peaks are 1. I will hold control on the keyboard and left click on 2, 5, and 7. And that should correspond to the very tiny peaks in the pattern. I will right click set peaks as excluded. Now I see that those have changed to a grayish color, so I know to ignore those peaks in my following steps. Let's go over to our sample of interest, the fluorite pattern, and do the same thing. I will go to peak list. I see peaks 2 and 5 have very small heights, so I'm going to right click, set peaks as excluded. And now I will ignore those. For the sharer analysis, we can simply go to Tools and choose Sharer Calculator. Here for the anode material, you will want to choose whichever anode you used for your experiment copper, molybdenum, cobalt, whatever it is that you have. This experiment used copper, so I will keep that. The shape factor I will talk to you about in a moment, but I like to start with the peak position column. And this is the peak position of the peak that you want to analyze from your sample of interest. So in this example, fluorite. So that we will get from this column, and I will fill that in for each of these three peaks. So the first peak is 28.232. Next we have 46.969. And then 55.714. Now B observed is the broadening of these peaks, and we get that value either from this column, the full width half maximum, or this column, the integral breadth. Full width half maximum is exactly what it sounds like, and is the full width of your peak at half of its maximum intensity. Integral breadth, on the other hand, is defined as the net peak area divided by the net peak height. So which one of these you choose will determine what your shape factor k is. So let's look at this, and we see that if we use full width half maximum and assume a spherical crystallite shape, then the shape factor would be about 0.89. If instead we assume a spherical crystallite shape and use integral breadth, that would be 1.07. And then you see here ranges for values if you assume different crystallite shapes. I will use the full width half maximum. I already have the shape factor of 0 0.89 entered here. So let's fill in this column with values from this column. So for the first peak, that is 0 0.35. Second peak is 0 0.438. And the third peak is 0 0.465. B standard, that is your instrumental broadening, so we want to get that from our standard pattern. And if you used full width half maximum for your sample of interest, you will want to use full width half maximum for your standard. 
and ideally you want to use a value from a peak that is as close to your sample's peak as possible. So here we had a peak position of 28.2 for our fluorite peak. So we would come here and find the closest orange peak that matches. And that would be this one, 28.53. So I will use this full width half maximum. That is 0 0.109. Here we have a peak position of about 47. And we just so happen to have a standard peak at 47.5. So I will use this full width half maximum, 0 0.094. And our third peak is at 55.7. And here we have a standard peak at 56.4. So I will use 0 0.094. As that is the value we see here. Now I realized that my peak positions for the standard peaks didn't match up perfectly with the peak positions of my fluorite sample but I don't feel too badly about using the values anyway for a couple of reasons. We have already seen that the k-value that we use is not all that strictly determined, so there is some error associated with that. In addition, I mentioned that Scherer's equation does not account for microstrain, so that is also affecting our results. In the grand scheme of things, being a tiny bit off and the instrumental broadening isn't going to hurt us too badly. However, if instead one of our peak positions was at around, say, 41 degrees, that's pretty far off from both of these standard peaks. What we could do is use this row and this row. We could use the two theta positions values and the full width half maximum values and interpolate in order to find what the full width half maximum would be at 41 degrees. And in that way, you can get a little bit more of an accurate instrumental broadening value for that position. But let's go ahead and look at the results now. We see that the crystallite size for the first peak is 336. For the second peak, it's 249. And for the third peak, it's 239. So the crystallite size drops greatly from that first peak down to the next two. And the next two are pretty similar. And you will notice that this one falls below that 30 degree mark and this one falls right in that 30 to 50 degree range. This one's a little bit farther out of the range, but we still seem to get pretty similar results from the second peak. So for this analysis, I would state that the crystallite size is probably around 249, maybe somewhere between these two, we'll say 245 angstroms. Here we see a comparison of results. The first column is the sample name, the second and third columns show you the results provided by Panalytical's help file, and the last three columns are the results that you will see in this series of videos. If we compare the third and fourth columns, we see that they match very nicely. However, the results are quite a bit lower than the rest of the columns that account for microstrain, and this shows you the effect of ignoring microstrain for a sample that has microstrain. That is pretty much it for this video. If you would like more information about the Gyme Diffraction Facility, please visit our website and you should see the address at the top right of your screen. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day.